Unit 2, Geological Oceanography. Here we'll do lectures 5 through 11. Lecture 5, Formation of Earth. So the formation of Earth, it all began uh, with our early universe formation with the Big Bang Theory 13.7 billion years ago. And that is when all the matter in the universe began to expand from a single point. Today, evidence suggests that expansion still continues today and that the universe is speeding up. The formation of our solar system came from a theory called the nebular theory. So basically, the solar system formed from a nebula that started to spin because of a nearby supernova. The sun formed the condensing gases at the center of the spinning nebula and the masses of the gases orbiting the sun condensed and became the planets. <clears throat> if you look here is a, a diagram of the Big Bang Theory, and here you can see pictures of the different galaxies. Now our galaxy is a spiral galaxy called the Milky Way. Once our universe was established, we had accretion. That was the formation of Earth, when a process by which particles clump together because of gravity and eventually, these particles kept on condensing together, coming together, to form our Mother Earth. The early history of Earth, it was very uh, harsh conditions. It was a fiery ball. Um, ox uh, oxygen was not in our atmosphere at that time. It was uh, rich with carbon dioxide gas until our planet eventually began to cool. Then there came the Orpheus theory, which is the giant impact theory. And basically what this theory suggests is that a planet-sized body struck Earth during its developmental time and sent some material into orbit. And some of that material ended up becoming the formation of the moon. So with the formation of Earth and the materials that have come together to form Earth, there's this thing called density stratification. Any type of stratification is some sort of layering. And when you refer to density, you know that the more, uh, the more dense a substance, uh, then it will go to the bottom, and less dense substances will stay at the top. So in density stratification, the heavy dense matter sank to the center of Earth and the lighter toward the surface. Of course, when we look at the structural diagram of Earth's interior, we could say that the densest part of Earth would be its core. From there, we had the formation of Earth's atmosphere. Earth's crust formed when it cooled significantly, and it led to the formation of our atmosphere. The gases released uh, from uh, volcanic activity that helped form our atmosphere included water vapor, H2O, nitrogen, N2, and carbon dioxide gas, CO2. As Earth continued to cool, our oceans formed when the Earth cooled for rain to accumulate in the ocean basins. Uh, it's suggested that the, the water from planet Earth came from comets bombarding Earth in its earlier formation. Then with that, oxygen formed. And oxygen formed in the atmosphere about 1.5 billion years ago when photosynthesizing organisms called photoautotrophs appeared. These would be the small, minute photoautotrophic, photoautotrophic bacteria in our earlier oceans. Because at this time of Earth's formation, we did not have land plants. So if we look at the anatomy of planet Earth, the inner core is the innermost layer. It is the densest. Its composition is mostly iron and nickel. It has a temperature of between 4,000 and 5,000 degrees Celsius and it remains solid because of high pressure. Surrounding the inner core is an outer core. The composition is mostly nickel and iron. The temperature is about 3,200 degrees Celsius. And the outer core is more fluid because it rotates faster than the mantle. So it's more fluid-like surrounding the, the solid inner core. The mantle is less dense. It's a cooler layer outside the core. 70% of Earth's volume is, is is the mantle itself. Its composition includes magnesium and iron silicates, which basically is rock. The temperature is 1,100 to 3,200 degrees Celsius. 
The mantle is a solid but ductile. It can move. Think of hot asphalt. Asphalt um, can move as you are, are building a, a blacktop surface. So you can press it out, you can move it around until it, it hardens up a little bit. And even at that point, under certain temperatures, you could still get that asphalt to move. And then finally you have the crust, which is the outermost layer of Earth. And the crust is divided into several parts. First you have the asthenosphere, which is mechanically weak forming region of the upper mantle. And then you have the lithosphere, which includes the crust and the uppermost mantle. This would be the hard and rigid outer layer of the planet. A moho is a boundary between the crust and the mantle. There are two basic times of types of crust. You have oceanic crust and continental crust. Continental crust is a lower density. It averages about 40 kilometers in thickness and is primarily granite rock type made up of sodium, potassium, aluminum, and silicon. Oceanic crust is more dense. It averages about seven kilometers thick and it's primarily a basalt type rock made up of iron, magnesium, and calcium. So here if you look, here you have your inner core, here is the outer liquid outer core, and then around that we have our mantle. So the mantle flows around that. Then you have the oceanic crust, which is the, the uh, earth layer at the bottom of our oceans, and then you have continental crust, which is the crust we would step on when we're stepping on terrain outside. So if we look at that again, here we also have uh, this would be continental crust. In the ocean basin here, we have the oceanic crust. And the area between uh, continental crust and the mantle, that would make up the moho there. So that is that boundary there, right there. The mesosphere itself is hot but stronger due to high pressure. The asthenosphere is hot, weak, plastic-like in fluidity. And the lithosphere is cool, rigid, and brittle. So, we know that there is such things as continents, and these continents have changed over time. This will relate to a topic called continental drift. So the theory of continental drift, uh, continental drift is basically the movement of Earth's continents relative to each other. Alfred Wegener proposed continents were joined at one point. 250 million years ago, the original supercontinent was known as Pangaea. Panthalassa, ocean that surrounded Pangaea, and Pangaea eventually broke up into what we see as today's continents. And you can see that here in the picture. Right here would be the United States of America, or North America. Wegener's theory was not accepted at first because Wegener was a meteorologist, so geologists did not take his ideas very seriously. He could also not explain how these continents moved. So if you look here, would be our Earth during the Permian period, then the Triassic, the Jurassic, Cretaceous, and present day. Evidence did come out to support the theory of continental drift because the shapes of the continents fit together like a puzzle. Plus, you have a fossil record, and fossils, similar fossils, are found on adjacent continents, such as Mesosaurus, which is a reptile found in both Brazil and South Africa. Or, or Lystrosaurus is a reptile found in both South America, Africa, and Antarctica. Glossoteris is a fern fossil found through the southern hemisphere. The seeds were too heavy to travel by wind and too fragile to cross by sea, so they must have been on one supercontinent continental landmass. And here you can see the patterns of those particular fossils throughout the supercontinent and what would today end up being the continents that we see. So evidence for continental drift also includes coal found in Antarctica. So here are coal pockets. Coal only forms in tropical regions of our Earth, and it suggests that Antarctica was indeed at a different place than in the past. Seafloor spreading is when the crust is created at mid-ocean ridges and destroyed at trenches. Lecture 7, sea floor, sea floor Spreading. The theory of seafloor sea spreading. 
Seafloor spreading is when the crust is created at mid-ocean ridges and destroyed at trenches. So mid-ocean ridge is a, a volcanic a mountain range and magma pushes up through the rift valley of the mid-ocean ridges and solidifies into new crust. Seafloor is pushed away on either side of the ridge and as the old seafloor is pulled downward in trenches where it then melts in the asthenosphere. This is estimated to take 185 to 200 million years. We will do a seafloor spreading activity in class. So if you look, here would be a, a mid-Atlantic ridge or mid-ocean ridge with its rift valleys, which would be the mountain range there. And up you have upwelling magma, and that magma is pushing the continental crust and oceanic crust apart. And eventually what would happen is this crust would go under and then uh, reliquify in the asthenosphere. So you have that, that widening ocean here as that continues to push. So increasing age of oceanic crust would be towards the continents, and you'd have new oceanic crust along the mid-ocean ridges. So evidence for seafloor spreading. Basically, the sediment layers on the seafloor become thicker as you move away from the ridge, because as you move away from that mid-Atlantic ridge, which runs up the, the middle here of the Atlantic Ocean Basin, um, the older oceanic crust would be closer to the continent, continents here. So there's a lot more time for sediments to deposit there. So that would be older stuff, on the uh, more sediment thickness on the oldest seafloor, and the youngest would have less sediment accumulation right around the, the mid-ocean ridge. If you look here as a diagram, so here's the age of the seafloor, the mid-Atlantic ridge, and the East Pacific rise. So here we have North America and South America. Here is that mid-Atlantic ridge running up. In red, you have the youngest crust, and then here you have the East Pacific rise. So here's North America. This would be California coast, South America and Peru, and down here would be that whole Pacific Ocean basin. Evidence for seafloor spreading. Symmetrical pattern in magnetism of minerals on either side of the crust. When new crust forms, it records the polar orientation of magnetic field at that time. And basically, you have a, a magnetic pole changes every thousand years. So the changes in magnetic field are recorded in the seafloor. So here you see in green, normal polarity. And then in red here, in these pink lines, you have reverse polarity. So that would occur every 1,000 years. And that's all for this lecture.